Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Creator of everything, we thank you for all that you do for us. God, you are the God of all creation, yet you love your creation. You love us even though we fall short at times. But God, we're so grateful for your plan of salvation that allowed your Son to come to this earth. And Jesus, we're so thankful that you gave your life so that we might be saved. Thank you for that beautiful gift. Thank you for all that you do for us, for all that you bless us with, you give us what we need, and even then some. We pray now for those that are sick and those that are hurting. We pray for the, the people of Ukraine that we can bring this war to an end and that the Russian people will understand that what they're doing is wrong and, and go home. We pray for them as well. Just help us, God, to, to do your will, to be the kind of people you want us to be, to be a light in this world, to love and trust in you more. And so one day, you'll take us home to heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen. After this, Kevin will bring us a lesson. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me my go ahead and dismiss tonight our ladies discipleship class with our young ladies and girls is going to be meeting during this time and it looks like you need a really good room <laughs> isn't that a blessing hey Jonathan number one Still ticking. Good evening. Great to see everybody. Isn't it just been a, the best day? It's been a great day. I think, um, I think one of these Sunday nights we get a good forecast like this, we ought to 
bring our fold-up chairs and build us a fire out here and have a devotional around the old fire pit, maybe cook a few hot dogs, enjoy some time around there. I think it'd be a great thing. We need to work on that. We are going to look at the book of 2 John tonight. We are going to just transition from 1 John to 2 uh, we believe they're all pretty much written in, in succinct order with one another about the same amount of time, uh, somewhere around 85 to 90 A.D., some of the last writings that uh, were compiled that uh, made up the New Testament. Uh, so I'm going to turn it on, and there we have it. Let me give you a little bit of background to the book of Second John. It was written by the Apostle John, as was the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, all written by John, uh, and of course, the Revelation. John pleads with readers in this epistle to do four basic things. To hold on to the truth of the Gospel, to live a life faithful to the Word, to love each other, and to not associate with false teachers and false teaching. Uh, and... That's a lot in 13 verses, isn't it? But each of these things is just reinforcing things that have already been said in 1 John. Why do you think they need to be reinforced? Still a problem. Still a problem. There are people that are having problems getting along with one another. There are people that are having a problem with false teaching. And so there are a lot of things going on that continue to be a problem. And John is going to continue reiterating what God's will is and, um, until the Lord is done with him here on this earth. And so he continues to do that. The book of 2 John is written, um, he identifies himself as the elder uh, to the chosen lady and her children. There's been some discussion as who is the chosen lady, what it's being referred to. And there are a couple of main options. One is that perhaps it is written to a lady who the church where she's at meets in her home, as it was common in the first century, that the church is met in different homes, um, and that she had children. Uh, it also could be that it was written in coded terminology. Why would you need to write something in code in John's day? Persecution. How about the Revelation? Does it not have a lot of symbolism in it? And so it's possible that John is actually referring to a congregation and refers to it as a lady because the church is identified as what? The bride of Christ in the feminine gender. And so it could be that he's referring to just a congregation. And then in verse 13, he's going to talk about to her sister, which if this is just a congregation, it could be a sister congregation. Whoever it is that he's writing to, whether it's uh, uh, written to a particular woman or to figuratively to a group of people in a congregation, uh, it doesn't change the fact of the content of what's going on. Um, and we can just have supposition about exactly who the direct audience was, but we know that the things that he wrote were not only pertinent to one congregation or one family, but to the church in general, and even doesn't it apply to us today? We're going to learn that that is the case. Okay? So, I want to share with you what I think is one of the key passages to this chapter or to the book, which is a one chapter book. It's found in 2 John 1 8, verses, excuse me, 1 John 1 8 and 9. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Um, kind of a sad thing to think about that people have invested themselves, their faith, their life, their work, uh, good deeds, all sorts of things, and the furtherance of the gospel, and then what? They throw it all away. All the things that they had been a part of their life, they suddenly cast it aside. And then what he says is going to be the result. They're going to lose their reward. How tragic that would be. The people that at once were faithful children of God 
would um, be convinced to live a life other than what we read in Scripture, and they lose their salvation. Second John chapter 1. Chapter 1, which is the only chapter. But anyway. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. So we have here in this one book, one chapter book, a theme of truth. Truth is permeating this whole 13 verses. He mentions it three times in just the first two verses. Why do you suppose he starts right out by talking about truth? Okay, because there, are, there is falsehood, there are others that are deceivers, there are false teachers, and that truth is important. That truth is, as MasterCard would say, priceless. Priceless, all right? Uh, I want to pause there for a minute, and I want to go to a couple of discussion questions. I want to ask you tonight, how important is truth to you? Not just from a spiritual standpoint, doctrinal standpoint, but truth in general. Does deception and lying and fraud, does that get on your last nerve? Do you despise being lied to? Deceived? Have you had people who do you, through deception, tell you one thing to your face, turn right around and be a falsehood? It kills me when someone says, I'm telling you, <laughs> well, hopefully that's just a little terminology. They didn't mean that and, and that, but yeah. Uh, or somebody say, I've said it. I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, I try to always tell you the truth. But anyway. Um, if you can't trust somebody, what have you got with them? Nothing. Nothing. Can you have a relationship truly with someone you cannot trust? No. How important is it for your soul's salvation that you rely on truth? You know, to me, it is appalling to me how many people have such a low regard for the truth in Scripture. I had a lady one time tell me, I know what you're saying is in the Bible, but I wouldn't trade what I have in my heart for a stack of Bibles. Now what are you saying? The Bible's useless and what they believe and the, con the conclusions that they've come to is of more importance to them than the truth. And here's what really breaks my heart. It's what's really sad. How many millions of good-hearted, well-intended, well-meaning people have listened to falsehood in their life and have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker and are going to be lost because they listened to the wrong people? Don't you know that's going to happen? That there are going to be people shocked beyond belief on the day of judgment because they never obeyed the gospel. They... Uh, they accepted falsehood and didn't relate it to Scripture and make sure that what they're being taught is of the Word. And they're going to, people are going to be lost because they believed a lie. How tragic uh, that people are so trusting that they just believe whatever. Based on what? You know what's interesting? Several years ago... Uh, Bill Clinton was running. I don't remember if it was first time or second time. But Bill Clinton was running for president. And they were asking people, why did you vote for him? Like an exit poll, why did you vote for him? And do you know what the second um, most common response was? He's good looking. He's a good looking man. So listen, let me tell you something. The people that participated in that poll, I don't know if they were serious. They could have been just bluffing as they were on their way out. But do you think there were people that maybe voted for him because they thought he was good looking? Do you think that there are people that believe people based on their looks? 
Well, they look nice, or they they look um, trustworthy. They boy, they they can preach a good sermon, or they can they sound really good, based on factors that, from an eternal standpoint, mean nothing. King Saul. King Saul. Let me tell you something. When I'm going to have to have some kind of a major surgery or something, I don't care what the person looks like. I want to know they're good at what they do, right? I don't get bonus points with my health based on their appearance. Oh, I thought, ooh, what happened to you? Well, I had surgery, but I'm going to tell you what, he was good looking. <laughs> well, he sounded like a doctor when I talked to him. Yeah. You know, there's been people that have been arrested because they were reporting themselves as being a doctor, having degrees on their walls, and even had surgery. There was a doctor that was doing plastic surgery here in Middle Tennessee who had never been to any sort of medical training at all. He just got in helping somebody, and next thing you know, they let him do some procedures, and next thing you know, he decided to go have his own practice, forge his own documents, forge his own diploma, and then he messed up some people, and when they went to court, uh, he got sued when they went to court, and then they were trying to you know, vet out uh, his background and his training, and then come to find out he had none. He falsified all of it. Now let's think about that from a spiritual standpoint. Everything that anybody tells you that you are going to rely on your salvation for, you need to know that it is truth. That it comes from God's Word. Okay? How important is truth to God? You know, I believe that there's going to be varying uh, degrees of punishment. I believe there's going to be some places in hell that are going to be worse than other places in hell. And I tell you this because the Bible tells us that for those who obey the gospel and then wandered from it and turned from it, that it had been what? It had been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the truth. And then Paul tells us that those of you that want to be teachers, we're going to be held to a different standard of judgment. They're going to be held to a higher standard of judgment than others. That being said, let me tell you, I believe some of the worst places in hell are going to be reserved for people who, who spoke falsehood in the name of the Lord. It's not going to be good. Truth is everything to God. Jesus Himself is the incarnate Word of God, incarnate truth. How devastating is falsehood? Well, we've already talked about that. There are going to be people that are going to lose their soul because somebody told them a lie, they believed a lie, and they lived a lie. And then in John 8, 32, it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Uh, so our points that we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Let me go back a little bit. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the, Fa the Father, Son, will be with us in truth and love. Now, sometimes we just kind of gloss over those terms that are being used uh, in the introduction of a letter or even at the salutation or the ending of a letter. How important are the words grace, mercy, and peace from God to you? It's immeasurable. Uh, these are not just words that are just niceties. These are not just words that are just thrown out there. And they are the source of these words are from God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and from Jesus, the Father's Son, be with those of us in truth and love. So, three elements, grace, mercy, and peace, comes to those who dwell in truth and in love. What if you don't dwell in truth, and what if you don't dwell in love? Because we've already talked about the fact that he's saying that if you're a true child of God, you love God and you love God's people. You, you love the brethren. But if you don't dwell in truth and you don't live in love, then what? You're not going to be the recipients of grace, mercy, and peace. They go together. So that if you're not going to be living out the will of God, then you're not going to be recipients of the reward of God. 
It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And I want to tell you that I think all of us could say that the most important thing for our children that we brought into this world or that we have raised is that our children know Jesus. It doesn't matter how successful they are in life. It doesn't matter how great a job they have. It doesn't matter how much money they accumulate, how much real estate they possess, how many children they have, how many of these things. Nothing really else matters if they're not Christians. So he says, it find, John says, I find great joy to know that your children walk in truth. Now, that's true whether he's talking to a particular lady that the church meets in her home. That's true if he's talking to a congregation. It is meaningful to know that the generations beyond us walk in truth and love and that live out the life of Jesus Christ. I can assuredly say that one of the most important things in my heart is that my children and my grandchildren and the children to come will all grow up to be children of God and be Christians. True Christians. Living a life dedicated to Him. Um, and sometimes our children um, take a detour. Sometimes our children are not faithful like we want them to be or they should be. But we pray that the seed is in them, that the seed has been sown, and that it will germinate and take fruit someday. And we hope that we live long enough to see it, but we pray that even if it doesn't happen in our life, that it will come forth so that we will see them someday. But there is no substitute for us to uphold truth to teach truth, and to live out truth in our homes and in our congregations. Um, you know, the last few weeks we've been talking about the women's role in Sunday mornings. And that's a real touchy subject with people, isn't it? There's some people that really... Um, get really fired up about the subject. And so because of that, what do you think happens in most churches? Don't bring it up. We don't want to do anything controversial. We don't want to talk about something that might offend somebody. We don't want to talk about something that might want to cause anybody to leave. And I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I would never intentionally say anything from the pulpit or even in my personal life to be intentionally offensive to somebody that by the way I say it would offend somebody and make them hurt, suffer, or leave. Never intend on that. Never want that to be. But I do want to declare this to you. I have a higher responsibility to God to teach truth than I do to make everybody happy. Because if we're not doing the will of God, then we're violating the will of God and we'll be held accountable for that. And I want to be able to sleep at night, to have a clean conscience, to know that I have taught the whole counsel of God and that I have taught truth. To teach it in love, but to teach it appropriately so that people know that this is the will of God. And I, I pray that you always feel that about me. And I pray that you always will have that kind of respect that I... That is, my passion. That's what I want to make sure that what I preach and teach comes to us from God's Word. And it is God's will for our lives. Um, having said that, um, it does break my heart to know that truth offends people. 
and that there are people that literally don't want to hear truth. I have in my preaching years, I have had people reprimand me for preaching on something controversial. Don't you know that you're just causing trouble? When I would say this, I don't want anybody to be outside of the grace and the mercy and the peace of God because I didn't tell them what God wanted them to know. What you choose to do with truth is up to you, but I encourage all of us that as much lies within us, may we always seek truth, live truth, and value truth. And now, dear lady, in verse 5, I am not writing you a new command, but one that we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His commandment is that you walk in love. And if you go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses tells the people that they're to love the Lord thy God with what? All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all your strength. Jesus reiterates that truth and then adds to it, and the second commandment is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all of these summarize the commands. The essence of God is love. The foundation of all that God has done is love. The sending of Jesus was done based on love. And Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we express our love for Him by the way that we revere truth, uphold truth, and live truth. Uh, So it's not a new command. Since it's something that's been taught for thousands of years, why is it so hard to put into practice? Why is John still talking about this being a primary commandment of God, not just to love Him, but to love one another? Why is it that hard? Ah, because of the devil. Does the devil sow seed of discord? And I've met a few of his ancestors. (laughs) But let me tell you something. Don't you know that, haven't you met people that they just love getting strife going? I've known the people that are trying to prod people or get something going between somebody else. They just want to say a little fireworks show. And there are people that will accommodate them. They'll jump right in there and Kick right in. Um, So yes, love is hard. It's authentic love is hard to find. And it's hard to see manifested because of the devil. He is the father of lies. He's the father of division. He's the the father of, of chaos. And so yes, it is his will to cause disruption and disharmony and hatred for other people. But why else is it hard? False teachers, which is kissing cousin to what we just said, which is absolutely true, Robert. Understanding. Okay. And and how about this? How about self-centeredness? Is it hard to love God and love others if you're your own God? And I, you know, it just... Blows my mind. You know, just in the last couple of weeks, there was someone that defrauded a PTA here in Middle Tennessee. They were the treasurer of their PTA group and defrauded their PTA of like $20,000. All this money being raised for the children and the education of children. And, and this lady was swiping money and using it to go on vacations and do other stuff. And like that? Um, How could you do that? Thinking about yourself. It's all about themselves. 
Just like that guy the other day, I was sitting there in the parking lot, had my turn signal on, was waiting very patiently for this, this car to back out and leave, and I could pull right in. And this other car comes flying around the corner, saw me sitting there, but the lady backed out the wrong way. You know, when you see somebody that's waiting on your spot, back out the opposite way of them. She backed up in front of me to go that way, and when she did, she blocked me. I couldn't go. Another guy come flying around the corner, slid into my parking spot I was waiting on, got out and was like, yeah. And what was he doing that for? He's more important, and he knew. He knew when he did. That's why he's carrying on like he was. Like, that's right, I got your card. I got your, your spot. And so people who don't love the Lord, people who don't love other people, and somebody does that to them, what do they do? They'll go confront them, or they'll do something to their car, or they'll just shoot them. Okay, yes. Um, but, but what I'm saying is this. How sweet is a life based on love? When you love God and you love other people and you want what's best for everybody in your life, in life a joy, in life peaceful, and guess what? As we live in the love of God and live in the love of Christ, even when these people get on our last nerve, do we find the capacity to give them love anyway? You know what I thought to this person who was being so arrogant and taking that spot and then like doing that little head bob at me? Like, you can have it. You can have it. Not worth it. I um, <clears throat> there was a car that um, was parked some kind of caca trying to take up two spaces. They didn't want anybody parking next to them, so they just took up two. And uh, these two guys in uh, these big jacked up Jeeps, um, they pulled in right up against them. They didn't touch the car, but they got right up against them rolled their windows down and crawled out their windows on both sides of the car and then went and hid. And then this person comes pulling up and they can't even get in their car. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly how they ended up getting in, but anyway. Um, but to go back here and think about this, uh, We can never get so caught up in our society that we become our, like our society. And that does happen. Does society rub off on us sometimes? Do we sometimes start thinking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world, relating like the world? Yes. Do we get sometimes desensitized to it? I remember my mother... Do anybody remember what year Gone with the Wind came out? 39. Um, when it first came out, what was the reaction of most people to that movie over one word? Shocked and appalled that that one word would be allowed uh, on the screen. Now, it may have been a great movie. You know, I think I've seen it one time many, many years ago. I haven't seen it but one time. But I just recall people telling me that there was a great uproar about uh, that word being used. Uh, let me tell you something. You can't turn your TV on today. 
I've cut the cable. Yeah, I listen to Christian music every day. But I, I, we've cut the cable. And uh, we, we have uh, availability to... Um, uh, we can scream, but, uh, stream, thank you, stream. We can stream ball games and other things like that. Um, TV is not fitting for the most part, even in prime time. Even the content of the shows have an agenda. Um, so we don't watch it. We just don't watch it. Um, because I don't want our family being desensitized to garbage or to be desensitized to speech. And every once in a while, our kids will come home, and when they're caught in maybe anger or something, sometimes they'll say a phrase or a word, and I'll say, what did you say? Da, 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 da. Where did you hear that? Oh, at school. Well, we don't, we don't talk like that here. We're not talking like that. Well, everybody does it. I mean, that, that's nothing compared to what I hear every day. I said, I'm, I'm sure of that. I have no doubt. But, but we battle all the time. We don't want our family to be marred and ruined and tainted and changed by world standards. And um, that's hard, isn't it? It's hard for our kids to understand that. They think that basically as long as I'm pretty good, it's okay to have some flaws. It's okay to throw some words out there. Once no, it's not. No, it's not. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. And such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Once again, we have uh, Gnostic teachers teaching Gnosticism that, that Jesus was a mystical person, but that He never lived here in the flesh. And there are people that thought that that was sophisticated teaching, intellectually high teaching, and that other people that believed he came in the flesh, they're just dumb. They're just dumb. They don't understand. They're not as smart as we are. You know what? I hear some of that today. I hear some teachings that where they put a bad light on Christianity, on uh, the creation, on other things. They, they talk about anybody that would believe that and uphold that as being just a bunch of old silly, um, know-nothing, um, just not very smart people. So once again, John is having to reiterate this. This is so important. That, that these four tenets that he, we talked about as being foundations for what he said in this book, this is one of them that we have to hold on to truth, obey the truth, and teach truth. And then the last thing that we talked about is this. We don't have any association with falsehood. And what John is going to say here is, don't welcome, don't allow anybody to come into your number that don't teach truth. Don't, don't allow them a foothold in your assembly. Don't allow them to have a voice in your congregation. Don't allow them to have any access to people that they can take them away from the truth. Now, do we need to be concerned about that today? Still to this day, there is such a thing as truth and falsehood. And we don't need to approach it as if, well, we all just have our own opinions about things. Now, there are some things that are truly opinions. There are things that we believe that might be just man-made tradition. But there are some things that are a done, unadulterated truth. 
And anybody that teaches otherwise is teaching a falsehood and is a false teacher. That is still true. And that's one reason why it is so important to have godly elders here who are responsible for feeding the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. They are going to be held accountable for what is preached and taught and done in a congregation. Our elders at Berea are going to be held accountable for what is preached and taught and done in this congregation. So is it important that we don't allow anybody to teach falsehood? Is it important that we make sure that whoever preaches here or teaches here, that they preach from the Bible and not the traditions of men, and they don't preach and teach things that are contrary to Scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have pledged to them my allegiance to the Scriptures. And I have pledged to them that I'll only teach what is found in the Word of God. Um, I very rarely ever will tell you my personal opinion about anything. And you know why? It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. But I will hold on fiercely to truth. Um, it has cost me my ministry once. And it's a terrible price to pay. But I wouldn't have it any other way. But truth matters. And we cannot kiss up to falsehood in our world today. And I want to say this. There are plenty of preachers and plenty of congregations that have sold out for popularity's sake to get more numbers in the building and more money in the plate. That's become more important to them than the preaching of truth. You'll never have that problem with me. And I know we'll never have that problem with the elders here. They made it abundantly clear to me what their wishes were of what I preach. And what I preach and teach, we talk about, don't we, brethren? We talk about what's needed here in the pulpit. And when I preach something, they will respond back to me uh, about it being truth. And they have a great appreciation for truth. And I want to tell you all how much it means to me that when I preach a lesson, they will respond back and say, Brother Kevin, thank you for preaching the Word today. You, you preach the Word and we appreciate it here. And that means everything to me. It means everything to me. And I know it does to you as well. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes them shares in the wicked work. How powerful are those two verses? If somebody is a false teacher who has stirred up division and falsehood in the church, what are you not to do? Don't bring him to the house. Don't ask, hey, what you doing tonight? Come on over, let's have supper. Don't take me to the house and don't welcome him. Don't give him any reason to believe that you are supportive of what he's doing nor are you backing it, nor are you kissing cousins with it. Now, we've talked, Lee's mentioned several times in his Wednesday night class, that sometimes in our fellowship in the churches of Christ, we always haven't approached truth with the right spirit. That we always haven't handled truth in the right way. We've actually offended people by the way we've done it. I don't believe that's true anymore. There, there are places that that is true, but it's not true here. And I want to say something. We should never apologize for being God's people. When I say we're part of the Berea Church of Christ, I'm not saying we're part of a denomination that meets at Berea named the Church of Christ. We're simply the church that belongs to Jesus. It meets at the Berea location. We're non-denominational. 
We don't want to be anything but the church that Jesus shed His blood for. And we will only preach things that give glory and honor to Him. And we will not allow, stand by, coddle, or encourage anybody that would speak or truth error or falsehood and stir up division and strive and split the church up. We are not going to have it here. Amen? You could have been a little louder with that. Amen. Thank you, Robert. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that your joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. So, the basic information has not changed. It's been reiterated. Uh, there's nothing new here in this particular book of the Bible, but the message is priceless. And it still even applies more than 2,000 years after it was written. That we need to love the Lord, love truth, live truth, and not have anything to do with falsehood. And then if we'll do that, if we'll love God, love Jesus, love the truth, His grace, His mercy, and His peace are ours. And there is going to be a great reward coming. As John says, don't lose your reward. I don't know, I was probably in high school, maybe maybe junior high. Um, I can't remember. But I had to take lit. And I like literature, some literature. Beowulf, not so much. But I like literature. And I believe, and I haven't read it in a long time, in fact, I haven't read it since I was in class. The Call of the Wild by Jack London, I believe, is the author. And I remember that some character in that book got caught out from their cabin in a winter storm, like a whiteout, a blizzard. And they lost their bearings, and they ended up crawling up under a pine tree and kind of built them a little cocoon in there, but they didn't make it. They died. Do you, those of you that remember that, I don't remember anything else about the book, but this one vivid detail, and it was this. You know where they found him? 30 feet from his front door. He got within 30 feet of his front door and froze to death. Folks, how tragic would be to have been taught truth, to have obeyed truth, and then be deceived and led away and walk away and lose your salvation. To have come so close, but to lose everything. I suggest to you today that the worst part of hell is not going to be outer darkness. It's not going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's not going to be excruciating pain or, or burn. It's not just that we'll be separated from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all of eternity. It's not just that we're going to be separated from the saints that have gone on before, maybe even our loved ones. You know what I believe is going to be the worst thing about hell? Is our ability to remember. that you spend all of eternity remembering what could have been. The invitation is yours. I hope that we'll hold on to truth, value truth, preach truth, live truth, be truth. If you need to come, why don't you do it? As together we stand and sing. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee.
morning, if you didn't have an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, it was prepared for you through these doors and to the left. You'll be dismissed and singing this last song. And then we'll have a closing prayer. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, Thank you. 